and uh, welcome to the 38th uh, Leadership Leaders Lecture by uh, Biju Dominic. He is currently the Chief Evangelist and uh, Chief Evangelist at uh, Frackle Analytics and also the Chairman at uh, Final Mile Consulting. And uh, if you look at his uh, profile, uh, I'm some, maybe some of you might have seen it. Uh, it's a very last year's, you know, spread into three different phases of his career. The first phase is, uh, you know, uh, before that, I know he he did his engineering from uh, 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 Trivandrum Co uh, Engineering College. And uh, after that, he did his uh, PhD uh, uh, from Xero Institute of uh, uh, Management. And after that, uh, he got into the world of advertising and brand uh, management, where he had uh, three different stints. First was with uh, Linters. For where he had uh, worked as assistant, uh, assistant vice president for six years. And after that, he had a very illustrious uh, journey with uh, Mudra Communication DDB India, uh, again as a VP uh, 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 vice president at this company for again for six years. After that, he was uh, the CEO of uh, DMA Branding for, uh, for 10 months. That's the first part of his life, I mean, the uh, career. And during this phase is when he got intrigued with this human behavior or the behavioral sciences or largely decision making there. And that led him to you know, combine very intuitively three different com you know, interesting stuff. One is uh, definitely to do with the cognitive neuroscience. And the second one is behavioral economics, right? Those of you are interested, I think, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure there are two Nobel laureates, right? Uh, who have written phenomenally great books and, you know, starting with the kind of experiments they've done in Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, that's where Daniel Kahneman, uh, you know, who got a Nobel Prize, later on, uh, you know, pursued by his uh, other disciples or, you know, what do you say, the prodigies, as you might call it, including uh, Richard Taylor in uh, Chicago Booth, right? And uh, uh, that's one. And this, uh, the, these two, one is a uh, cognitive neuroscience as well as a behavioral science, uh, behavioral economics. And he also added to these two the idea of design. And that's where uh, you know uh, the idea of uh, you know behavioral architecture is coming. And therefore, that uh, you know I think uh, kept on uh, intriguing him. And therefore, he along with three of his friends has started a beautiful consulting company called as uh, Final Mile Consulting, uh, which uh, by the way uh, got acquired uh, uh, by uh, uh, Fractal Analytics. Where where he continues to be the chairman of the Final Mile Consulting. And uh, in this co in a company that is in Final Mile Consulting, like you said, which he started with three of his colleagues. Now, uh, uh, again, you know, they have given to uh, rise to a lot of uh, uh, interesting stuff, but two important things I must call out are from the point of behavioral uh, sciences is, uh, you know, they have developed a very interesting consumer research technique called as Ethnolab and the new communication practice of what is called as a non-conscious design. And these are all very, seem very, uh, uh, counterintuitive, but trust me, they have risen to a lot of uh, great results. So much so that you know uh, they had the pleasure of working for some of the very interesting uh, fire projects. It looks very simple because uh, you know what behavioral economics somebody like. Uh, uh, Dominic uh, do is that you know all of us see these events or happenings or any phenomenon but then they wear a different lens and that's what make uh, uh, these people very very different from all of us uh, for example at a uh, you know, final mail they have developed effective solutions to mitigate the spread of HIV uh, reduce road accidents reduce transport uh, you know trespassing uh, accidents on the railway tracks especially in Mumbai uh, you know I know and I've also pasted by the way uh, the all the list of articles that he has published with many since 2009, right? It's a phenomenal list of articles, and uh, I wish uh, uh, each one of you go through at least uh, some of them. They're phenomenal in the sense that uh, they give you a different perspective as to how you can look at a human problem and then come out with a great solution, right? And uh, that's the second stint. And right now, he is, like you rightly said, evangelist. And when in the frame of evangelism, what he does is definitely continues to write every, almost every week for a Minter newspaper and also teaches and then engages with uh, institutions and companies like us, you know, just to spread this idea of uh, uh, the behavioral economics and therefore how it can go to the boardrooms and also the drawing boards of, you know, some of uh, each one of you when you're trying to solve any customer related uh, problem. And uh, therefore, we're going to have an interesting uh, topic uh, I mean, that he's going to be talking on is what is called as a what's new in human behavior, right? And let's have the pleasure of welcoming him. Uh, uh, Dr. Biju, uh, uh, Biju uh, uh, welcome to this 30th uh, Leadership Lewis Lecture. It's absolutely a pleasure to have you. And uh, you know, uh, I'm sure all of us, uh, uh, along with the participants, will have very, very insightful, uh, I would say, I would say uh, not just insightful, but actionable insights at the end of this uh, lecture, uh, Biju. Over to you, Biju. Yeah. 
Hi, um, hi everyone. It's uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nagendra. I think it's uh, it's a pleasure talk, uh, discussing uh, with uh, talking to all of you. So what I'll do is I'll um, make my thoughts presented. I'll present it for the next first uh, about 35 minutes or so, and then leave the last 15, 20 minutes to listen to all the uh, you know discuss with you uh, your queries, agreements, disagreements with whatever I have uh, spoken. So that's what I'll do. So here I'll just begin my presentation. Is my slides visible? Yes, Biju, absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. So here goes. Um, yes, what's new in human behavior? I mean, I know each of you listening to me is involved in one management activity or the other. And uh, so there's something there common in between all of you. Um, I'm sure in one way or the other, you have to deal with human behavior. So let me begin with uh, a simple question. And uh, the question is, what is it that you've learned um, about new, about human behavior the last few years? Now, I wish it was a face-to-face -face conversation, so we would have had a certain discussion. Just the other day, I was in Goa uh, speaking to about 25 to 30 of the chief HR officers of some of the leading companies in India, and I asked them to the same question. Uh, no hand really went up. And then I said, okay, I'll share with you what I have what I've been trying to learn about human behavior in the last 32 years of my career. And uh, I'm going to share with you one significant learning. And to me, that learning has sort of changed my very outlook towards human behavior. Um, so much so, uh, Shankar Vedandam of the Washington Post, in his book called The Hidden Brain, said this facet that I'm going to speak about, he said, this new understanding constitutes a revolution uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's constant revolution, no less intriguing, perhaps more powerful than the discovery that the sun really does not revolve around the earth. So it is as fundamental as that. So what is that? What is that understanding of human behavior, which has come in in the last about 15 to 20 years? And I happen to be one of the professionals in the world to pick that up and uh, start using it. In, in, and applying it in, 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 in trying to solve some of the most significant problems in the world. Um, so, uh, and obviously you'll see that with obviously results which are really, really good. So what is that significant discovery that is not just incremental to our knowledge, it just completely shifts to the other, other end of the spectrum. And that is, um, uh, to, so set that up, so I have to look at what has been our traditional understanding of human behavior. Our traditional understanding of human behavior is that people are conscious. They know what they're doing. And if I really have to study human behavior, all that I have to go is go and ask them, organize a few focus groups or do some interviews and ask them, why did you do what you did? And they'll tell us. You can ask them to convert that into Likert scales and other things. So you can then use mathematical SPSS, other packages and all that, and then come up with your own analysis of it. And then you say, yes, obviously there's a rationality that man is rational. He picks up all the information that is required to take a decision, analyzes all that information, and then takes an optimum decision. So that's been the way we have always believed human beings are. Let me take you to the early morning of 22nd of May, 2010. Captain Glusika was taking Air India Express back from Dubai to Mangalore. So he had along, he's the chief pilot of Air India Express. Air India Express took the flight from Mangalore and went to Dubai, landed there. Obviously, after a few hours of uh, this one, you now he's coming back. Uh, Captain Glusica is not just an ordinary pilot. He's a pilot with more than 10,000 hours of flying time. He's a man who trains trainee pilots what to do and what not to do. So one of the most experienced pilots Air India Express ever had. 
And as soon as the flight takes off, it's a fairly long two and a half hour flight from Mangalore to Dubai. Uh, he goes off to sleep, which he's allowed to sleep. And he sleeps. Um, and uh, just about 15 minutes before the flight was to land. And until then, his co-pilot, Mr. Singh, is in charge of the flight. Is all perfect. And just about 15 minutes before the flight was to land, Captain Glusiga wakes up. Their hostess asks him, sir, you'll have a coffee? He says, no. Uh, why did Captain Glusiga, uh, you know, take control of the flight? Because DGCI uh, rule says if the airport is the tabletop airport, you cannot, a co-pilot, even, even a co-pilot cannot land the plane. The chief pilot has to take control. So Captain Glusiga takes control of the flight. And as he's about to land, one, two, three, four, four times the machine, which is one of the most sophisticated machines with all the dashboards that you can ever get, actually tells him, don't land, do a go round. I mean, we are far too high, so do a go round. Not just the machine, his co-pilot, Mr. Singh is saying one, two, three, three times he's telling him, sir, we are far too high, let's do a go round. So just a few minutes before, just a minute or so before he was to land, Captain Glusiga had seven warnings not to land his plane. But Captain Glusiga landed the plane. And in that process, he, along with 169 other people, died. Why did Captain Glusiga land? Was it uh, lack of awareness? Because that's what we have always believed in. Because consciousness of the human being is such a strong facet of our, of our belief system. Any problem solution is always, we have a panacea, awareness building. Build awareness and solve will be solved. But in this particular case, it is one of the most significant accidents that has happened in this country. Was awareness an issue? Or was there something else? Now, so much so, I think we didn't even discuss it. Here there was, and if you look at the Inquiry Commission report, is very clearly saying that this was the, the reason. Why did the newspapers, why didn't the academia actually look to this particular problem and say, hey, that means despite awareness, that means somewhere the actions, the appropriate actions don't happen. Can we learn something from this for our business of uh, solving some of the social problems in the world. Because there is that, that, that existing paradigm of conscious being is very much there. We didn't even want to unsettle that belief. So we continue. But for me, this has been an ongoing problem of this you know, human behavior and my inability to understand. These are just some of the brands I launched in the first 15, 17 years of my career, you know, and the brands I've handled would be much, much more. Some of them like that, you know, Reliance Infocom is the biggest marketing launch in terms of spends this country has ever seen and maybe will ever see. But where is that brand today? Most of these brands don't even exist today. I think it has always hurt me when I was in that industry that I have crores of rupees the clients are giving me to influence the human consumer's behavior. But despite spending crores of rupees, despite having some of the brightest creative talents working with me, I'm not doing a good job. It always hurt me. And that's why in 2007, I was forced to take a different path. And I think since 2007, I think I've definitely walked a different path. And it's just not my own mistake. It's not the old, just take the recent one. As soon as the COVID came in, we said, oh, it's a problem. It's a new problem. And then people said, vaccine is the only option. And people said, vaccine? Oh, it's going to take at least eight to 10 years. Then the best of the epidemiologists, the virologists, the healthcare people, they all came together and said, no, no, we need to find a solution. They did find a solution. But when they found the solution, they said, oh, we need um, you know, to transport this at a very different temperature. So that the best air cooling and other systems, the carriers and experts from the companies like that, they came along. They said, oh, it's not enough. It has to go reach every corner of this world. Then the best companies, the FedEx and, and the UBS, all the best of the, you know, the supply chain companies in the world, their brains came together. They all 
came together. Some of the brightest people in the world came together. In a matter of eight to 10 months, we produce a vaccine and the vaccine was available in every healthcare center across the world. All that we had to do was ask the human being who's sitting in his living room, hey, 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 <laughs> there's a vaccine out there just nearby. Can you just walk across to the healthcare center and then just get yourself vaccinated? Now, Gates Foundation has asked my team to study that. Why did, why was people hesitant? Why couldn't we not get the, we got everything right. Where the technology has to play a role, where supply chain has to roll, everything we got it right. But when it came to dealing with how to, you know, influence human behavior, the best minds in the world have no clue. And this has been an ongoing story. 90% of the new products continue to fail. 70 to 90% of the change management programs continue to fail. I think when it comes to human behavior, I think you know every other department of an organization, supply chain, production, finance, they all work at a Six Sigma level of success. But those departments of the organization that are dealing with human behavior have a Six Sigma level of failure. And how do you deal with it? <laughs> Don't even talk about it. Because the best way to deal with a problem is to believe there's no problem. Look at the academia, look at, uh, you know, our writings are all run. Do people say that we don't know how to deal with human behavior? We are pathetic. We fail 90% of the time. No one says it. But I think I have to admit, if anyone stands up and says, no, 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 there is a way we have, I'll, I'll touch his feet. But I've been in this field for the last 32 years. And I have seen failures after failures after failures in trying to deal with human behavior. And that, 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 what I'm seeing in front of me just forced me to look at human and said, is there a new way? Is there a different way of, of understanding human behavior? And that led me to the source of all human behavior, which is, and Francis Crick, who also came up with a fundamental discovery, all of us know. He, and I remember reading this statement somewhere in the, in the mid nineties. And he said, you, your joys, sorrows and ambitions and sense of free will are nothing but, you know, a was assembly of, you know, electrochemical reactions between your years. I said, that gave me the feeling if I had to understand human behavior, I think I need to go to the source of human behavior, which is a human brain. So if I can understand how the human brain functions, then I can actually understand human behavior. And that was a huge sort of a, you know, eureka moment for me. And I think one of the, and I said, I said, I have lots of learnings about the human behavior, which is from the neuroscience, but I'm going to share with you only one learning. And that is this, which is we have about 11 million bits of, you know, bits of processing capacity in our brain. And I began somewhere my talk by saying we believe we are very, very conscious. Now, what are the number of bits that are available at a conscious level? That is 40 plus 30 plus 5 plus 1 plus 1. That's the number of bits that are available at a conscious level. Now, this is one of the most significant learning that I have picked up in my last 32 years of trying to search of understanding human behavior, that is 99.99999% of human behavior happens at a non-conscious level. And we have no clue about it. Is this Zimmerman's paper the only paper that speaks about? It? No, I've been picking up studies after studies that have been talking about it. There was, Um, uh, for example, there is this uh, video that you would have seen. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, the audio is not working. It doesn't matter. But basically, I'm sure you might have seen this particular video. I just want you to see this video one more time. 
There is a team in uh, uh, you know white. There's a team in black. They're just exchanging uh, a basketball. Just see the number of times the passes are being made. Just have a look at it. Now, what does this say? I think I know some of you would have said, Abhiju, I've seen this video before. I saw the, uh, you know, the, the gorilla before, of course. And then let me ask you, there was that girl in, you know, with a white head, uh, you know, hairband. Did you, how many times, uh, what, how many passes did that girl make? Now, the point here is very simple. Conscious brain can do only one thing at any point of time. Multitasking is a misnormal. But right now, where is the position of your leg? Where's the position of your tongue? Where's the position of your hand? What is doing to your digestive system? None of it has been thought through consciously. You've actually all done it non-consciously. That's what I just want to mention. So one is the bigness Zimmerman spoke about. Here is another very clear showing the limited capacity of the conscious brain, which can just do one thing at any point of time. Or there is this very famous experiment by Benjamin Libet in the 90s. And what did he say? Because we, we, you know, even our morality, the religion, everything is based on the concept of free will, which says, before I do an action, I know what is right and what is wrong. And my consciously, I'll decide either to do it or not to do it. Now, Zimmerman, uh, sorry, uh, Benjamin Libet, all that he did was he told the people under your, your, your fingers, there is a switch each under each finger. There's a switch. You can actually press any of the switches that you want. Obviously, they they were asked to press at a particular time, but the decision on which finger to use was theirs. Obviously, their hands are attached to extremely sensitive computers. But what Benjamin Libet found was that yes, people assume they decided to use the little finger and then press the switch. And it takes about 200 milliseconds to, you know, that to become an action potential and become an, a pressing and then happens. But what is interesting is 500 milliseconds before I said I have decided to use my little finger, the computer knew that I'm going to use my little finger. Ah, okay. Now, there have been subsequent experiments on the Benjamin Libet's work. It has not disproven it. It is only said it is not 500 milliseconds. It is now three seconds. Some studies even go on to say 10 seconds, which means much before we consciously take a decision, there's another part of the brain that actually is taking decisions on your behalf, which is obviously the non-conscious part of your brain. Or have a look at the squares A and B. Obviously, what is the color of that? Square A is A and dark, and square B is light in color. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to cover all the things around these two squares. Mm. Now, this is what I showed you in the beginning, where I, I, I don't know you can see me. I think it's a, uh, I just... Uh, can you see me? Oh, yes, no, I think there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. So there is square A and B. This is what I did. All that did was I cut all the other elements and I just showed this to you. Now, I'm sure there's explanations. I can go on because in detailed classes, I tend to explain is the role of context because, uh, you know, the cone, the shadows, although your eye has been told to look at only A and B, we don't do that. 
It's the context influences our decision. But today, since we speak so much about the power of conscious brain, I just want to do one thing. I'm holding this in front of me and you're looking at that uh, image on the, the screen. Can you convince your eye that AA, hey, hey, you did tell us it's all because of the, the context that we have taken the decision. And uh, so it's actually they are of the same color. And here I'm holding it as a proof. But tell your eye that A and B are of the same color. Has your Does your eye believe you? That means much before you consciously are trying to do things around there. There is a part of the brain that is taking decisions for you. You walking through the forest, <laughs> you stopped. <laughs> and, and then you look at it and said, oh, it's a twig. Okay, and let me walk. Now, nah, hold on, hold on. There were two parts of the brain that were involved in the decision making. One, you saw something you thought is a snake. And that decision bypassed a lot of these major processing areas, went straight to amygdala. Amygdala said, that's a snake. If the snake, then from an, you, it could bite you, it could kill you. Stop, man. And you stopped. And then there was another part of the brain that took that image, sensed it, compared it to all the snakes that you've seen. It's not a snake. Then you compared it, oh, it's like it's a twig. And then send a message back to you saying that that's a twig. Okay. Now, that's a much slower much more deliberate, much more. Yes, that's the right one. But there was another part of the brain, which is the emotional parts of the brain, that was taking the decisions much earlier than your conscious brain. Now, which is, again, another proof to prove that there is a part of the brain that is actually taking decisions completely unknown to you. Now, I know I've said so much, and you still, I know you don't believe me. Then I have to take you to the... because. Uh, the sports field, and I have to get, uh, you know, and uh, and because most of the brilliant work as far as the non-conscious, you know, the brilliance of our non-conscious processes are being done in some of the universities like Oxford and others, where they're actually analyzing uh, how sports people play. I don't know how many of you ever done the mathematics of playing a cricket shot. Now, when a ball is bowled at about 145 kilometers per hour, the ball leaves and then reaches the batsman that crosses the 22 yards in about 0.45 seconds. That's pure mathematics that you can do it. Now, what happens in that 0.45 seconds is actually being tremendously being studied. Now, I'm going to take you to post the 2003 World Cup. Uh, some of the younger generation might not remember, but some of the older generations uh, of my age Dr. Nagendra and others would remember 2003 World Cup, India plays against Pakistan. Sachin Tendulkar is on that brilliant form where he hit Shoy Bakhtar for a six on the first over. But when he came to 92, if I'm right, he developed cramps. The whole of India told Sachin, Sachin, take a runner. Now, Sachin didn't take a runner. But he came to 96 and 98, the rising ball from Shoy Bakhtar, he got caught out. The whole of India was wondering, why did he not take a runner? Now, this is an interview that Harsha Bogle is doing with Sachin Tendulkar after that World Cup when India had gone to play in, in England. Unfortunately, I'm sorry for, uh, you know, uh, the audio is not perfect, but you'll see it in the internet. But I'll still tell you what Sachin is actually telling you. So Harsha Bogle is saying, Sachin, you know what you did in England? We did this. We kept a, a, a mic just under your this ones. But you have a habit. You know what we, you were doing? You know, before the ball is bowled, you actually says one, and you actually play that ball for a one. Or another ball, he said, you said two before the ball was bowled, and you actually played that ball for a two. And it's very reaction. You'll see Sachin's reaction at the time when I end the video. Just have a look at this video.
I'm not playing that, but I think you will see when Sachin was told by, uh, uh, by Harsha Bokli that you have this tendency of saying one or a two, Sachin's reaction is, hey, do I? Do I do that? Now just imagine, Sachin is someone who's aware of every bit of his game. But there was a bit of his game where before the ball is bowled, he's actually saying one or a two, and he's actually playing that for a two. Now, that is so much for the consciousness or that he has. But if you really do the mathematics of it, as neuroscientists would do, they realize that there is only 0.45 seconds for him to take that decision. So a lot of people who even played cricket, I'm sure quite a few listening to me would have done that. I think when they say, I take the decision what shot to play by the last delivery of the bowler. So that image of just delivering the ball has to fall on your retina. And it goes to multiple parts of the brain the way you see it. And it takes about 220 milliseconds in most of the cases to decide and say, okay, now that's going to be a ball that's going to pitch and it's going to, it's an outswinger. But now he has to remember then, okay, that's, a, that's not this prediction. He knows where it is going to pitch, where it is also, he's also predicting to what height that he would even, the ball would come to. And then he says, if that is it, I need to play a shot. That means he lifts his bat, goes back, and then comes to meet the ball exactly where it is. That takes another 0.2 to 0.21 second. And which means the time that is available for someone to take a decision is just about 0 0.01, 0 0.02 seconds. And which also reminds us this, that everything the brain does is a prediction game. It is just anticipating which means whether it's in tennis, cricket, or even in our life, as we walk along, the brain is actually anticipating, anticipating ahead of the event. But all that I want to mention is all these studies across universities, across this, is clearly telling us that the non-conscious is very big, that we saw it, but the non-conscious is also much faster, much faster than the conscious. By the time the consciousness comes and comes up with it, much before that the non-conscious takes a decision. And that is what is guiding our behavior. So I think based on it is where we have now a new understanding of human behavior, which means human behavior is predominantly a very non-conscious. And emotional, I have not mentioned, but I think that's another very significant learning. And this is a completely new revolutionary understanding. No wonder Shanga Vedam said that this, that means the very center of the human behavior universe, the way we have learned it so far in our business schools, we have practiced it, all our research methodologies, all our community research methodologies, as said, focus groups, questionnaire methods are all asking what have you done? Believing man is very conscious. Look at our communication techniques. Drive slowly, danger ahead, don't worry, you know, be careful. All consciously writing huge poems around believing that that is what is going to change human behavior. And that now we now we know why there is a 90% failure rate, because the maps that we were drawing, the whole strategies we were developing was based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the very construct of human behavior. So obviously the question that you would ask is, okay, then how do we really understand it? Whether non-conscious of an individual, non-conscious of an organization, non-conscious of a society, how do we do that? I think that's where we went on to develop a new research technique called the ethno lab, which is wherein if people are playing games, it's very gamified where we don't ask questions. We put people in decision-making mode and, um, and, and we just observe what is happening. Obviously, those are all based on hypothesis that we've actually developed on deeper understanding of it. Now, I think the only two times, you know, the, yes, the, the Oscar of market research are the SOMR awards. We enter the uh, SOMR awards only twice. That is 2015 in Dublin, 2016 in, in New Orleans. In both, the best case study in the world was a final mile case study. Wow. And these are not simple things. 2015 was on voluntary male circumcision in some of where we were working it out in some of the African countries. 2016 was on girl trafficking. Uh, we studied the supply side of it on 
you know, uh, in 24 Parganas in West Bengal and Warangal in Andhra Pradesh. On the demand side, why do men go for paid sex? We did that in Bombay. And if you see the citation of it, they would actually say this technique is so powerful. It is able to get into even some of the most personal of our behaviors, which is our, our sexual behaviors. And that technique is clearly helping us. But techniques are not just about the awards, but it's about the insights that is able to bring in. Can this technique bring in insights which otherwise I wouldn't have ever got it? And one of the most significant problems that we worked on is the most, the single largest cause of death in Mumbai city, of unnatural, uh, unnatural cause of unnatural death in Mumbai city. It is people getting hit by the train. 10 to 12 people die in Bombay every day as they cross the railway tracks. And uh, railway authorities asked me to, to study this. It took us about six months. And the first thing we realized, and where we went to every accident spot from Churchgate to Kalyan, which is 56 kilometers. And I have gone there every place. But one thing you realize is wherever the accidents happen, you can see a train coming in almost, you know, almost a kilometer away. How can or why should someone get hit by a train that you can see coming in? I think that's where we went into the brain of the people. And the neuroscience gave us an answer. They said, our brain has a deficiency. Evolutionarily, our brain has seen small objects move and we could judge the speed of it perfectly, a deer or a rabbit, and our forefathers could judge of the speed of it and then kill it and then have their breakfast. But evolutionarily, uh, we haven't seen, our, our brains have not seen elephants, giraffes, all moved very, very slowly. And our brain started seeing large objects move fast the last 100, 150 years. Now, 100, 150 years is too, too, too short a time to make any impact on the brain. Or let me take another case where one of the large insurance companies came to us in India, came to us and said, we have about 15,000 frontline sales staff. They are doing a lot of mis-selling. They're giving over promises, false promises. Somehow they sell the you know, insurance policy. They collect the commission and go. But obviously, the customer after a year or two will come in and say, sir, 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 they told us that suddenly the company realizes, yes, false promises were made. They're forced to give back the money. And that's a huge loss. And that's when the CEO said, Biju, can you study the behavior? So we looked at them. And one of the things we realized is all these 98%, 99% of these employees are very honest people, very good people. But when they walk into an organization, they just look around to see what the organization is doing. Oh putting another extra signature, 18 signatures are there on that form. I went all the way up to, you know, there to get a signature. I forgot one of them. I called up the customer and said, sir, I can't file it today because, sir, your signature is missing. And the customer said, kuch karo, yeah, just do something. And so I just forged one signature. So people said, sir, that's customer service, sir. So they said, I know, sir, that's illegal, but this is not immoral now, sir. So we started getting insights about behavior, which otherwise we wouldn't have really got. But it's not just about insights. Yes, we got the insight that the, you know, the trains, you can't judge the speed of it. Now, what do you do? If you have, I would I follow the traditional conscious communication, what we would have done is we would have done the what automotive industry, the, the brightest engineers have been telling us, you know, in the review mirror, objects in the mirror are closer than what they appear. And has it ever appeared closer to you? We just done a legal tick mark. I've done it, sir. I've done the awareness creation. Don't, not, don't, don't hold us responsible. So I could have, my team could have put up boats across Bombay by saying trains are faster than what you think. So be careful. Such conscious communication wouldn't have worked. So my team decided to go deeper into the brain and said, okay, they're not able to judge the speed of the train. But how do people judge speed? Oh, okay. Oh, we are not able to judge the speed also on the flight. Why is it? Ah, because judging the speed involves a reference point. If there's no reference point, we can't judge the speed. Okay. If that is so, can we create a reference point? Ah, okay. Let's do that. And that's exactly what my design team did. Now, this is Vadala, which is one of the stations in, in Mumbai. And you will see the extreme left of it is beyond is where at Wadala station. And first of all, accidents happen not at stations. It always happens far away from the stations. Extreme right is where people trespass. And that's also a constant place. 
what did we do? We fed, left a few sleepers empty in the direction of the train, then painted five of those sleepers in yellow color. Then 15 of them were left empty. Then we painted another five of them. Then 15 of them were again left empty. Now, what the, it does to you is there are five blobs of such yellows. When the train comes from there, these people just stand there and they look back. So we ask them and they let the train pass. The, the speed at which yellow lines disappear becomes a reference point for these particular people. But you ask people in Vadara, and later the railway minister said, please roll it out. Just before COVID, we rolled it out in Thane, Mumbra, Kalva, and all that. And we couldn't roll it out because then the COVID came in subsequently. In all of them, you ask people in these places, what are those yellow lines are for? They'll say, sir, Malu Naya, sir. I don't know, sir. <laughs> because normally where we cross on the roads, they have these lines. But this, I think, are for the motormen, which means we are we have made them, you know, judge the speed of the trains. They don't know that we made them do that and save their lives. Um, we were asked to handle road accidents in India. It kills about 300,000 people. And, uh, uh, you know, normal, this one's are drive slowly, danger ahead. So ahead of this picture is where you'll see a village. And that's been one of, this is Bangalore Hyderabad Highway, where a large number of accidents were happening. And our traditional solutions would have been danger ahead. So many people have died there. So drive slowly. We know people don't look at that. Nor we said, then we said, okay, how do people judge speed? Because driving is one of the non-conscious activities we do. We're just having a conversation with our, with our co-passenger, but the lecture on the accelerator or on the brake, which gear, all of it is non-consciously thought about. So we said, how do people decide non-consciously to move le their leg from the accelerator to the brake? We said, that's how when things are going past them. They have a, a sort of an intuitive feel of how things are going past them. So we said, let's play a trick on that. So we have these white lines on the road. But what we've done is the distance between these white lines, as it appears the danger spot, we've actually made it closer. So what it does to you is the white lines are moving, then the white lines are moving much faster. And automatically, your leg moves from the accelerator to the brake. And speed gun studies before and after actually showed 32 to 38% reduction in the speed. And you'll see the accident uh, reduction even later when I show you. Or now this is exactly where, again, another big accident spot in, in Hyderabad, Bangalore Highway, because there is a road from the down coming up, merging with the highway. And, you know, vehicles from the main carriageway obviously goes and hits against it. And what did we do? We just created lines. Even Cyrus Mistry's driver, if there was this sort of a line before that particular bridge, she would have not gone straight into that. She would have taken a bit more to the right at a non-conscious level. Now you can see the traditional solution. You can see it on the left, merger ahead. In English, it's all written. Now you'll see all this has got nothing to do with the language, nothing to do with it. It's deep inside at a very, very brain level with no language, but using some of the very deeper understanding of feeling of territories. I shouldn't get in, let me move into my own territory. These are some of the fundamental constructs of the brain that we have used to create it. Or when we had to reduce, you know, bring in that integrity within the organization, one place that we went to is that much before final mile started applying these, the organized religion has been using these principles for a much, much more years across. So you, I'm sure you've seen those pumpings out there, which is the pujari does some mantras, takes it all, and then asks us to go and throw the pumpkin out. So that's exactly what we did. We told these insurance companies, we need us, do you have a Sunday mass? He said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, have a meeting where every week your colleagues meet and have a discussion. And what is the discussion? It's about the sales last week. What is the competition up to? What are all the kiras they're up to? Yes, they're all write it down on a sheet of paper, or write it on a board. And they'll say, now we are an honest company. We're not going to do any of them. The leaders are asked to crumble those papers like a pumpkin and throw it in the dustbin and go. That's all we did. But, but uh, you know, my friend, uh, you know, uh, Elliot Fishback of Chicago Booth would say, if you want people not to fall into a temptation, get them to discuss the temptation. And that's what organized religion has been doing every Sunday or every Friday. And we just took those and brought it in into the organization. But look at it. 
the results. Now, this is the single largest cause of, we took Wadala because 17 deaths in six months had gone to 23, the highest increase in, in, in deaths in Bombay. But the first six months, it came down to nine. And obviously, I know the question that will be there in with you also, will people get used to this? We said, put it up for six more months. And now it, from nine, it came down to one. Year on year, a 75% reduction in accidents. And you also show that the solutions only become stronger as it becomes, you know, stays for a longer time. Look at the reduction that we've achieved across highways in India. Even if we achieve 50% reduction, because the road accidents in this country causes this country 3% of its GDP. That means if these solutions are implemented across, there are only 6,000 6, black spots in India, which means these are applied across 6,000. We would add 1.5% to the GDP of this country. And that is the power of these solutions, just this one project alone. Look at what we've achieved in that organization with in creating integrity, the terminations in a one, all dramatic decrease that has happened out there. And I think the Wadala case study is now a global case study. Philip Kotler's latest edition of his book would actually have the Wadala case study explained in three pages for you. Or, uh, you know, the mis-selling that I did, it's uh, recently uh, the NHRD network had actually published that as a case study out there. So all that I want to mention is this human behavior is the most complex phenomenon that you can ever deal with. Now, what we are doing at Fractal today is that we are not using the traditional approach. We are using some of the latest cutting edge areas of computational neuroscience, system neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, behavioral economics, AI and design. And we are looking and developing a completely new path of looking at human behavior. Yes, we can continue to look at the old traditional way, but I just want to tell you that there is a new way that has emerged in the last few years. I just want to give you a glimpse of that particular journey. And I can tell you that in the last 15 years, Final Mile has worked on some of the most significant problems, human behavior problems in the world. And I think we have proved it, that uh, it is much more better to work with that as compared to the traditional approach to human behavior. Any questions, please? I think, uh, thank you, uh, Vishu. I think it's a quite a, uh, you know, bigger, very large canvas on uh, human behavior and, you know, uh, and largely about uh, the behavioral economics as well. I think we have a few questions with your permission. Like, can I take this, some of them? No. Oh, great. Before I take uh, all the, I think we have a few questions. Before that, I just, out of curiosity, let me ask you. I think recently, I think sometime back, I don't know exactly, maybe a few months back, you know, uh, there is a lot of uproar about the one tweet that Elon Musk made, right? And in the tweet uh, of all the things that he does, I mean, he has been known for some very, uh, people say, irrational, rational, uh, leaving aside that one. I think that uh, tweet has become known for the fact that in that tweet, he has uh, uh, outlined 50 human biases. And therefore, he said that you should be uh, cognizant of this, and therefore, you should be you know, wary of this uh, biases and things like that, right? But the question to you, uh, Biju, is that I'm sure each one of us, all of us, maybe uh, we would, most of us may not even be aware of the uh, you know, terminology of this, but I'm sure we will leave those uh, uh, biases. But even assume for a moment that we get to know about this 50 biases, how confident can we be that, you know, over a period of time or within a stipulated time that we can actually overcome, uh, you know, some of those, for example, let's say, you know, attribution biases, right? Or, in, uh, you know, any of this, or let's say halo effect, you know, that we all always you know, suffer from. So even when we know that we suffer from those biases, but yet we don't become, uh, we continue to be victim of that bias, but then we don't become uh, released of that. How? What explains this kind of phenomena, Biju? Uh, yes, knowledge of the biases just doesn't help you. Um, uh, and it doesn't help you to get over it because okay. biases happen at a non-conscious level. And many okay. of us don't even know. When we, just, we might say gender bias. No, 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 no. I am uh, always I'm consider them to be equal and our behaviors tend to be very different from what we believe what it is. Even those white lines that you saw, there's a friend mm -hmm. of mine, my, my own co-founder, Ram, was taking his car. He said uh, to, uh, to Bangalore, he said, that's our white line solution. I'm not going to move my leg from the accelerator to the brake and I will drive over it with my leg on the accelerator. He couldn't. 
to the end of 350 meters, he realized his leg was on 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 the on the break. And that's a part of these solutions. Uh, these are very fundamental constructs of the brain that has evolved over millions of years. Mm -hmm. When we use that, it's very difficult. And um, that's one. Second is since you mentioned biases, uh, Professor Taylor used to invite me to Chicago booth and mm -hmm. I've delivered lectures there several times, even before he won the Nobel Prize. And I used to tell Professor Taylor also that, sir, heuristics and biases are only one small facet of the human behavior. Mm -hmm. You really want to understand you know, the shortcuts the brain takes is only one small facet. Uh, we need to understand the larger world of the neuroscience to get a much wider perspective to human behavior. So I just want to mention that also. So Absolutely. just to reiterate, biases, just knowledge of it just doesn't help you to get over it. You need to have other solutions to deal with the biases that you have. Great. Now, let me uh, take a question from our participants. And there are two questions from Mr. Ashish Mahetra. And this first question is, uh, uh, respected sir, is behavior related with the brain con conditioning? And is the second uh, part of the question is, uh, 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 you know, uh, advertisement, right? Uh, brain condition leads to change in behavior and how habits are related. Yes, I think uh, brain, uh, human behavior is the result of our brain's conditions. And uh, it, uh, there's a lot of things that have genetically come to us. There's a lot of things that have come to us also from our nurture. So nature and nurture together has created uh, what the connections in our brain, and they're influencing every bit of the behavior that we do. And I think whoever is trying to influence your behavior, whether it's the advertising agencies, whether it's the politicians, whether it's the organized religion, whether it's the beggar on the street, uh, they all uh, are have a very intuitive understanding, and most of them have a brilliant intuitive understanding of the way our brain functions, and they most of their strategies are based on uh, on that. And I can tell you, compared to the ad agencies and professional people, these people, the terrorist organizations, uh, the organized religion, the politicians have a much better understanding of the functioning of the human brain than the ad agency people. Absolutely. But they're all trying to influence human behavior by influencing the functioning of our brain. And uh, this is a, a question from uh, uh, Mr. Ratna Pratim Chaudhary. And his question is, uh, dear sir, great to get connected with you on this platform. I have a question for you. How to overcome failures in our daily course of work and how to focus on something which is needed as an action item and the utmost requirement in organization point of view? Thank you, Ratna Pratim. Yeah, I think um, it's, um, you know, there is something called memories and memories are what guides your future course of action. And failures tend to emotionally affect us far more. And that because of that, and whenever failures happen, your those memories of those failures tend to be much stronger. Use that as a good weapon because use that as a good, that's why people say failures are the best teachers mm -hmm. because successes also, you know, just the memories are not very good, uh, too fleeting away. And whereas use the, you know, the, that memory of your failure to motivate you to actually do things better. And it's called long-term potentiation. And if you do that, obviously, um, you know, that's where, whether it's in the organizations or whether it's in, um, you know, as an individual, you can do. And one other thing I just want to mention again from, a, from an organization, sorry, from a you know, from a change of behavior is capture those stories. For example, uh, there was a large organization who had asked us to induce uh, factory safety and road safety among the employees. So instead of making a litina of certain instructions, what we did was we created, we collected the stories of people who met with accidents in that organization. And we wrote the stories from the family members' point of view. Now, these are failures. But these are failures with all the emotions attached to it. And that was from the family member. So instead of the traditional safety manual, we created these stories, books, as a safety manual. Now, remember, all the organized religion have their story books, the Holy Bible, the Quran, the Mahabharata, and nothing but stories. And they use stories to powerfully communicate what they want to communicate. And most of those are failures of people. And uh, remember, there's a lot to learn from the organized religion on how to really go about building very powerful organizations. Great. So I, I want to ask you one thing, uh, which I think most of us, I think everybody experienced in this country, the rest of the world, definitely in India. 
I think one which is very close, I think all of us experience, um, not everyone that way, but I think we, what we have seen is that uh, on every cigarette packet, there's a statutory warning. And, you know, you have seen uh, with uh, very, uh, very gory pictures, quote unquote, you know, kind of thing. But yet, you know, people tend to buy that uh, 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 video. I don't think, uh, you know, they have, there's ever been a reduction in the, uh, uh, you know, consumption of uh, this cigarette. That's one. And every time you go to theaters, at least, you know, most of the times you see the advertisements, right? But yet, you know, the, the moment you come out of it, maybe during interval time or maybe once a movie gets over again, you go back to pick up your pack of cigarettes and just light one cigarette. So how does, you know, even when that the so-called fear of losing your life is not even inducing the reduction, the consumption of the cigarettes? Yeah, it's because I think uh, we took that into consideration because there was a poster that we also developed in Mumbai to make sure people don't cross the railway tracks. Mm -hmm. And the Central Railway used to show people dead and saying, you know, here is uh, whatever, you know, that Lord, whatever death used to standing by and all that. <laughs> we said, don't do it. Uh, yeah. And because we said the cigarette people do not understand neuroscience there. Because if you really go into our brain, we realize our brain do not have an experience of our death, even in our dreams. Mm -hmm. Even in our dreams, when we fall down, we're about to hit the floor, we'll wake up. <laughs> so when you show death, that mm -hmm. is always someone else. I mm -hmm. mean, there's no relatability. Uh, and uh, that is why. So you need to create relatability. So when you see the poster of mm -hmm. what we developed for the railways, it didn't show uh, that the man has been hit and he's died. It shows a man when the train is almost there. And so there's a fear, which mm. a lot of Mumbaikers have gone through. And uh, we, so we don't show death because I don't relate to it mm. because I know experience of it. But fear is a very, very powerful emotion. For that matter, the emotion of fear has actually has saved far more human lives than modern medicine. Absolutely. And we have used that in also for road safety. You know, if we had, and, and I didn't have time, along with the lines there also, uh, we created, uh, you know, signages which are again fear creating what I call injections of fear. And I think that has really worked. And that is what cigarette people have to understand. If they had understood neuroscience, uh, the brain processes, they would have designed it very differently as we did it for both for road safety and also for uh, the trespassing problem. Very insightful, very insightful. Uh, but, but just also to say road, uh, the, the cigarette smoking has gone down. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reason is no one, uh, I think the first time in the world it went down, and that is because of a high court ruling in Kerala, <laughs> where the people said you can't smoke in public. public. So what mm. it was, what was an individual problem, I think mm. that judgment made it into a public problem. Right. And uh, right. and that that has very significant issues, but I've discussed about it in my columns, but obviously you can see it. So it's on a decline because yeah. of that one judgment, which subsequently has now been across the world, that judgment has become where... Uh, the, the, yeah, the public air is mm -hmm. people, you don't have right to pollute it with your smoke. Yeah, what is an individual problem became a social <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's that's a strategy. They just exactly. converted that into a public, public now, problem. I have two more questions uh, uh, with your Please. permission. Uh, uh, one, the next one is from Mr. Tej Trivedi. And his question is, isn't it true that we run on autopilot mode for most of our responses? How to overcome that? Thank you, uh, Dej. Uh, we take about 3, 000, uh, 35,000 decisions in a day. And if you ever bring it, uh, all those decisions to your consciousness, mm -hmm. you freeze. Mm -hmm. That means you, what the decision that you're taking at a conscious level with those 75 things, now if you start processing it, every one second of a non-conscious decision is equal to two and a half days of conscious processing. So please don't. And in sports and in singing, that is called choking. Whatever has been non-conscious, if you try to bring it consciously, you choke. That means you start thinking of every bit of your shot and then you, you choke. It's called in sports, it's called choking in golf and others. Or in singing, if you think of everything you do and you allow consciousness to step in, you actually are taking away the efficiency of your, of your actions. So don't, uh, you know, take away that uh, role of the non-conscious. Okay. So by bringing in consciousness, one, it hugely delays it. Two, it actually only makes your decisions very, very ineffective. Read on choking in sports and you will hear, read more. You will get a good, better feel of that. 
And uh, the last question for today evening session, uh, um, Don Bichu, is that it's from Mr. Sham Babu. Uh, his question is, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful insight. Can you please explain Mumbai case once again? Uh, I really uh, I'm confused about it. Thank you, yeah. Sham. <laughs> Yeah, so just in Mumbai, it's because uh, people, hunt, I mean, thousands of people cross the railway tracks and they're seeing the train and they think they can cross because on the roads, that calculation, we get it right because, you know, you judge whether the car is, should I run, should I not run or should I allow the car to pass by? That judgment is very good because evolutionary, we are good in judging the closing distance of a vehicle. But on the on the train, we, we think the train is far away because uh, you know, because of our misjudgment and we start moving and suddenly we realize the train is much closer than what it is. So we underestimate the speed of a large object by close to 40 percent. And that is what is causing a misjudgment and the people get uh, get hit by the train. And once the train is too close by, your heartbeat goes up to 175, which is fear. And then you freeze and then you can't really move. And uh, that's what uh, creates a problem so it is a deficiency of the of the people to not able to judge the closing distance of that train which is causing the problem and it's not because they're not seeing the train they are seeing it that's the key to that particular problem Thank you so much, Bichu. And uh, we're sorry in case we have overshot the time, but it's absolute pleasure, uh, you know, hosting you and listen to this, you know, nuggets of, uh, you know, insights into behavior. Of course, like we said, it, there's no way that we somebody can master the, all this in just about one session. But again, like was, I've was, written some, I think, just the, before you came in, I think it at least sensitizes all of us to, you know, what direction, at least we know what not to do, or let's say we know where to pick up the cues from. I think that's very important. But absolutely, you know, wonderful uh, to have you uh, and, you know, listen to you your insights and especially coming from your 32 years of uh, research and uh, you know i'm sure uh, although all of this uh, maybe in the first 18 years have laid the strong foundation for i think the cues for research <laughs> right oh, <no. laughs> absolutely uh, great thank you so much uh, uh, uh and thank all of you participants for a wonderful uh, you know being audience and i'm sure uh, we'll continue to have the next one now uh, 39th also we're looking at it and again uh, this is a uh, very interesting topic on digital transformation and that's going to be one very senior gentleman from a body shop. And I look forward to hosting you next uh, week again. And thank you once again from all of us, uh, Biju. It's a wonderful and I'll continue to be uh, bothering you and troubling you for some more things. <laughs> we belong. Glad to. Glad to. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thanks so much. Yeah.